Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to go for another round of question and answer, so we're going to go to further debate. And I recognize the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker, and, uh, and thanks for the encouragement from my folks. That's great. I am very pleased to be able to stand and put some uh, put some thoughts on the on the record here with Bill 39. Um, I wish that I had more time, so I'm going to cut right to the chase. This particular bill is a lot for just three schedules, um, and I'm going to focus mostly on uh, one of the schedules we haven't heard a lot about because being from the Durham region, I think it's very important that somebody out of the seven Durham MPPs gets up and tells this story. So I will be. I will be the one. Speaker, I, I love being heckled, but the particular member, uh, if he could just stay tuned and heckle, maybe we're more appropriate. Um, but, Speaker, the schedules one and two of this bill um, are about democracy. Order. Order. Speaker. Um, sorry, let me just figure out who is the member. Oh, the member from Brampton North, of course it is. Anyway, so I'm going to focus on my comments here, and I hope that the member from Brampton North um, jumps up and asks some questions when it's his turn. So, Speaker, this is fundamentally about democracy, but I'm going to break it down for you in terms of schoolyard, because I, uh, that's what I come from, and I think that breaking it down for folks um, makes it a bit clearer. If you have six kids on the yard and they want to, they're deciding whether or not to play freeze tag or hide and seek. Normally, if you have a group of three and three, one of them is going to be the deciding factor, right? Whether you play, play freeze tag or, or hide and seek. So you need four to decide. But not anymore. Not in the province of Ontario. Not with this. Now you just need two, right? Because a third, a third is all that's required now um, for councils with one of these provisions uh, in, in this bill, this schedule, is that a mayor only needs, for certain motions, only needs a third of council to support them. So here's a letter that I got from someone. Bill 39 needs to be stopped. I did not just vote in a municipal election to now have that person that I elected not necessarily have a voice at the table. The strong mayor's power directly threaten our democracy. Nobody should be granted the power of pushing through bylaws or other legislation with only one-third of the vote. What are you doing in this province? How are we sitting back and allowing this government to enact these laws which give ultimate power to the few? Do the right thing. Stand up to Ford and put an end to this nonsense. Bill 39, Bill 28, and stopping public comments on his Greenbelt plan are all direct attacks on democracy and our ability to use our voices as a collective. That's how dictators lead. This is not the future I want for my children. Do the right thing. Stop this bill, says Christina Coughlin. That's a real person. Folks are having real opinions. And I would have said, Speaker, that the government is hearing these, that they're getting the same emails and phone calls, but some of their offices, I didn't know if you knew this, aren't even staffed up yet. So I'm happy to, uh, to share those emails with them, but this is part of why Ontarians aren't getting answers, eh? Anyway, I, I'll go on. Here's another one. Uh, a letter from James who says, I'm writing to ask you to vote against Bill 39, Better Municipal Governance Act. I believe this bill conflicts with our Canadian democratic principles. Schedule 1 allows bylaws to be passed with the support of fewer than half of city councillors in Toronto and Ottawa. I believe that if the majority of a city opposes a bylaw, then this bylaw should not pass. Um, normally, I'd write to my own MPP, but this law only affects the cities of this law only affects the cities of Toronto and Ottawa, so I believe that MPPs from other regions should consider the opinions of people who would be affected by this bill. Also, it begs the question, who's next? And, Speaker, um, the member from Brampton North was hooting and hollering about Oshawa, so I'll tell him about Oshawa. Um, Oshawa Council tells Queen's Park, hands off the green belt. Um, Council had given a clear direction to the province. This is, uh, this is an article from Insaga gave clear direction to the province on their recent swap of environmentally sensitive lands for land in the Paris Gulf Moraine. Keep your hands off the green belt. Oshawa Councillor McConkie brought the motion before Council on day one of the new term um, and basically said, quote, when you make a promise, you should keep it, and pointed out that even though Oshawa wasn't directly involved in the deal, will definitely affect our headwaters and could lead to a further loss of pristine lands in the future. This will be hard to undo once it has started. Councillor Bob Chapman agreed, saying the province, quote, shouldn't be encroaching on the Greenbelt. It's sacrosanct. 
Speaker, we're in this House talking about Bill 39 today, but Bill 23 and 39 are all attacks on our future. Um, I want to take us back, though, into our history in the, the limited time that I've got. So I got a letter from Bonnie Litley, uh, who's the co-founder of the Rouge Duffins Green Space Coalition. She campaigned in the early 2000s to protect the uh, Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve Act, okay, which is what Schedule 2 is in this bill. She said the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve was public land sold back to farmers at $4,000 an acre on the condition it remained agricultural by way of easements on title in 1999 to protect this prime class one and two farmland for future generations in perpetuity. This speculation will be a huge ripoff of the public purse. It is the most protected land in all of Ontario, easements on title, in the Greenbelt, and MZO to protect the area from Pickering doing the planning. The former provincial government took their planning rights away when they kept trying to pave the preserve and created the Central Pickering Development Plan where the preserve is enshrined as agricultural, plus its own legislation, Bill 16, the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve Act. The minister spoke of lands that are appropriate for development because they're beside an urban area. That logic is 80s sprawl logic since a ton of ag lands are beside urban areas. The Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve is also nestled between Rouge Park which also has a lot of agricultural activity, and the other side protects one side of Duffins Creek. Then it can be argued it's appropriate to have an ag preserve where it is. Also, why is there no mention of the homes being built right now in Seton? Pickering also is identified as an urban growth center in the provincial growth plan and is required to hit certain densities in the urban core before moving into new greenfield sites. They are approving condo towers as we speak. In short, they don't need any new lands for development, period. This is not passing the smell test. End quote. I had a chance to meet Bonnie, and we had a good chat at the rally. Um, there were, I don't know, 200 people, give or take, uh, in Pickering. So I was glad to spend a Saturday, freezing cold Saturday, with them. A lot of those folks have been fighting this fight for a long time. So a bit of history, Speaker. In '93, the NDP government established the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve. In 98, the city of Pickering endorsed the conclusion of a rural study, which called for that land to remain rural. And just for folks at home that are like, what is she talking about? Schedule 2 of this bill says that that Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve Act should be repealed. And that's like this government has to peel off that safety, that protection, in order to take that chunk of land out of the Greenbelt. Okay? So when everyone's talking about Bill 23 and, and um, you know, pulling stuff out of, of the Greenbelt for development, in our neck of the woods, this has to happen first before they can get at it, because okay? this is like super-duper protected land. Um, in 99, the Ontario government, Durham and Pickering signed an agreement to protect these lands as farmland in perpetuity, which means forever and ever and ever. After this agreement was signed, the Ontario government began selling that land to farmers cheap, but as a condition of the sale, the, purchase had, the purchaser had to agree to easements or limitations, protecting the land forever as farmland. And in 2005, a Globe and Mail article said that the Sale of those lands was overseen by Tony uh, Mealy. Is that how you say it? I'd ask the PCs. I think you guys all know him. But anyway, you can just nod. Meal, Mealy, something like that. Um, who was then the president of the Ontario Realty Corporation. He's been in a couple of different articles lately, like the Toronto Star uh, Friends with Benefits investigation on the PC-connected beneficiaries of the Highway 413 proposal. And even more amazingly, that guy who was involved in selling off the lands is the chair of the PC Ontario Fund. So the PC Party's campaign donation war chest. Like, <laughs> just so interconnected. Anyway, um, and um, back in the day, in 2003, shortly after Mealy sold the protected farmland to various farmers for next to nothing, companies owned or controlled by Silvio de Gasparis snapped up these properties from the farmers, buying all but three lots of his current land holdings, uh, totaling more than 13,000, excuse me, woo, 1,300 acres. He paid a total of 8.6 million at the time, which is next to nothing. Um, bought up a lot of land that was supposed to be protected forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Anyway, here um, there was a developer-funded uh, growth management study that contradicted that uh, earlier recommendation. Then the Liberals came, uh, put it into the green belt, thwarted to Gasparis and his plans for vast riches. Um, flash forward, here we are, 
and this is a government that, you know, uh, land dispute is being re resurrected nearly two decades later by this PC government, um, and whose political donations are collected and managed by that same Tony Mealy and De Gasper stands to make bajillions of dollars. Someone could correct me on the exact figure. I'm out of time. Thanks, Speaker. Thank you. We'll go to question and uh, recognize the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, the member from Oshawa's presentation. Speaker, young families, newcomers, and those all over the province, province dream of having their own home near where they work and play, and a dream which continues to be out of reach for too many as demanded outpaces supplier and place more and more pressures on our housing market. Industries, as Beck has said, that but decisive action is needed now to address our current supplier crisis. And according to the Scotia Bank report, we need 1.2 million new homes now to meet the G7 per capita rate or the 10 years target that the task force and our government has set. They question? need to change its career. So, Speaker, my question to the member is why does she? Uh, does not agree that urgent action is needed to address Ontario housing crisis. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Oshawa. Uh, it's interesting that nothing in this bill has anything to do with housing, but I'll answer his question uh, using the um, TRCA responded to response to planned repeal of the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve Act. This was um, from November 16th, was posted online, the Conservation Authority, and then mysteriously taken down. I don't know why, but anyway, archived online uh, because nothing ever really goes away. And as I'm quoting from that, they said, quote, it is well established that earlier this year, the province's own housing experts implored them to protect the Greenbelt, noting that there is sufficient developable land available to address the housing supply crisis without Greenbelt lands, end quote. Um, they also said in this uh, scathing letter that was uh, disappeared, unlike the typical process followed for other urbanization proposals, there has been no watershed plan or sub-watershed plan Response. and supporting environmental studies completed for this area involving Toronto and Region Conservation Authority to inform this decision. Um, this is, this is where we find ourselves today, Speaker, and I'm more than happy to answer any more of their Thank awesome you. questions. Thanks. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Oshawa for that presentation. To the member, through you, Speaker, I've been grappling with this notion of minoritarian rule, as, as the member said. I've been grappling with the notion that a 30 per cent vote is now a majority in the mentality of this legislation, and I'm going to presume with the government. So I just want to reflect on the fact that in the last election, 10% of the electorate voted for this caucus, 10% of the electorate voted for your caucus, Speaker, the, the Liberal caucus, in addition, uh, part voted for the Green member and what the Green member has elected, 20% voted for this government. So. If this legislature is actually reflective of what the people of Ontario voted for, Question. we would be a majority. But it would seem, Speaker, that if Bill 39 is to believe, the NDP currently could be in government with the Liberals. It, how does the member feel being in, being in government if the member applies this, if the government applies this principle? Thank you. Over to the member for Oshawa. There was a lot of math there, and I think it come, it, it it can be uh, it can be boiled down to the basics of. Fair is fair, and unfair is not fair. And if you were to put this, as I used a, a you know, not to make light of it, but I used a schoolyard example, um, if suddenly a third was all that was required for, you know, for decisions to be made, um, we would find ourselves in a very unusual province, which I think is what this government is trying to do, is create all sorts of chaos so that we don't know where to look. Um, and to put through their own initiatives without the majority uh, either being convinced or being involved. You asked me how I'd feel about being in government. I would love to be in government, and I, I would be so excited to get rid of a lot of those folks over there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the next question, please. I recognize the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, earlier today, I talked about visiting an enterprise located in Thornhill by the name of Macrodyne. 
Macrodyne Technologies is a thriving, state-of-the-art facility that creates hydraulic presses, and they serve international markets. They are very, very good at what they do, and they showed me exactly what they do. I was incredibly impressed. Madam Speaker, when I sat down with them at the boardroom, I asked them, what is your biggest issue? What can Ontario do to help you? And they said this very succinctly, please build more homes. Their biggest problem was keeping employers, sorry, keeping employment. Question. Nobody would stay there. They couldn't, there aren't enough homes. There's simply nowhere for their, them to live. So, Madam Speaker, on this side of the House, we understand the need for working diligently with our large municipal partners to build more homes. Did the opposition not recognize that the province has a role to play in ensuring that we plan for growth? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member for Oshawa. Um, the members on this side of the House have a concept of affordable, and a lot of the employers realize that their employees don't have places to live in their home communities where they work um, because they can't afford it. So these these McMansions that may or may not happen, I don't know that that's going to address that, but let's talk about what the member had asked, you know, about actually building homes. You are putting a lot of faith in people who are really excited about massive profit margins to build homes. They don't have to, by the way. By reclassifying watersheds, now that's Bill 23, but it's all the same here, right, the green belt and just opening it up. Um, these developers are under no obligation to build anything. The minute that you reclassify a watershed and it's now what, the land formerly known as wet or whatever you know, you're going to call that wetland is now moist meadow or something, they've already made bajillions of dollars on paper, right? They don't have to build anything. So at what point do we see in this legislation or 23 that Response. they will indeed actually build homes? Show me. Oh, I'm so glad the member from Brampton North is back. Woo. Thank you. We'll go to the next question, the member for University Rosedale. Uh, thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> I um, was wanting to ask you again about uh, the, the Green Bill. Uh, this bill uh, does make it much easier for uh, PC uh, donors uh, who happen to own land uh, in a section of the Green Belt that's being opened up by this Act. Um, why do you think um, the government is choosing to open up sections of the Green Belt in areas near you? Thank you. Over to the member. Thank you. Well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to um, an article from the CBC. I think it was, I don't know if it was yesterday or today. It's hard to keep up. Wealthy Ontario developer close to winning long battle to build homes on protected green belt. So in my area, um, Silvio de Gasparis, you know, started buying up uh, parcels of land back in 2003. And back in 2005, he told the National Post that the province's move to include the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve in the Greenbelt would cost his company an estimated $240 million in lost revenue and said, quote, McGinty has already hurt me, I'm going to hurt him, and launched a campaign to stymie plans for the Greenbelt, uh, working with Pickering to develop the preserved land anyway. Anyway, it keeps going. Victor Doyle, a former senior provincial planner uh, who helped design the Greenbelt, in his words, to answer your question, said, he felt, quote, deceived as a planner and as a citizen, quote, it's all about, in my view, rewarding the land development Response. interests who own this land and are clearly of primary interest to the government, quote, said Doyle. Um, these are folks who stand to make a boatload of money. They have, de they have been investing in this uh, conservative government since 2014. Thank you. That's time for response. Thank you. Another question, the member of the member from Markham Unionville. Madam Chair, for the past few weeks, we have a lot of uh, hearings to listen to stakeholders. And one of the stakeholders, he told me, uh, it was, he was answering my question. I asked him, how many years does it take for you when you have submitted all your documents and then you can deliver? the House. He said 10 to 11 years. I want to ask the member from the opposite. Under their proposal, how fast can they deliver 1.5 million houses in 10 years? Thank you. Member for Oshawa. Um, so, Speaker, I appreciate that the members of the, the government caucus 
like my, my word choice in using bajillion. Um, the point is, but, but I use it, I use it, and it seems a bit flip, but the point is, I don't, I don't have any faith in this government that they are indeed going to deliver on their promise because that isn't their MO, right? Like their, their MO is to make the promise, not deliver on the promise. So how long? Great question of how long you're going to take, but also it's, will you even deliver on those homes? Because again, we don't have assurances. We do have a lot of profit margins um, in, this, in this legislation, 20, Bill 23. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to further debate. The member for Brampton North.